Good evening. Good evening and welcome. I'm Kitty Robinson with Historic Charleston Foundation, and I welcome you here on behalf of Foster Gilliard, our board chair, our trustees, and our staff. We're delighted that you could be here. It's wonderful to see so many residents. A lot of this is what everybody has been talking about, so I hope that tonight that we will learn a lot from our expert panelists and you will have plenty of time to ask some questions. In January of 2010, Historic Charleston Foundation held a forum entitled The Delicate Balance. At that time, we were focusing on new developments planned for the peninsula that would be coming about in the near future. We had a terrific panel of experts then, as we do tonight, and we had some invaluable discussion that led to the formation of the Peninsula Advisory Commission. It was from that newly formed commission and its Committee on Mobility that this forum, four years later, has come about. And we've certainly seen some major changes since 2010. We are grateful to the members of that Mobility Committee for playing the key roles in arranging and participating in tonight's meeting. In particular, I want to thank Winslow Hasty, a member of that committee and the Chief Preservation Officer for Historic Charleston Foundation. He has led the effort, our efforts for this forum, and he's joined by both um, in, with by Tom Bradford, who is the executive director of the of Charleston Moves, and is also on that mobility committee, and Tim Keene, who's also on that committee. He's the city's director of planning, preservation, and sustainability, and William Cogswell, another member of that committee, and who is tonight's moderator. This forum tonight is just the beginning of what we hope will become a much larger conversation. We are also most grateful to the other co-sponsors of tonight's forum, and I ask that you join me in thanking Charleston Moves, Carta, and the City of Charleston for their generous support in doing so. We are particularly grateful to William Cogswell for his leadership and for his willingness to moderate tonight's program. William is a trustee for a star at Charleston Foundation and also serves as chair of our own advocacy committee. He's also now serving as the chair of the Peninsula Advisory Commission and has been a member of that commission since its inception in 2010. He is actively involved with the Urban Land Institute, the Nature Conservancy, and the Coastal Conservation League. He is the owner of WECO of Charleston LLC, and as such, he is the lead developer for the exciting redevelopment of the Cigar Factory, one of the most exciting projects underway on the peninsula today. Before William comes forward, though, I'm very pleased to say that Mayor Riley is with us tonight, having just conducted a city council meeting. So he is going to say a few words to us, and we're so grateful that he was able to conclude that meeting and join us. Mayor Riley. Well, I'm so glad I could as well to, to be able to come and to, to thank uh, Kitty and and William, uh, the foundation, and uh, Tim, my uh, wonderful colleague, uh, Terry, uh, uh, acquaintance for many years, and we've worked together, and, uh, and Rick coming from a, a great city that has so many transferable lessons for, for cities around the country, and pleased to be with my colleague on city council, Dudley Gregory. Dudley, if you stand and be recognized. <clears throat> You know, I, I, I put the, the issue of, of mobility in the same category as I do uh, other wonderfully uh, successful uh, uh, nationally important initiatives that the city has, uh, has, has led the way in. The historic preservation movement began right here in our city. And uh, in the late 70s, we developed our nation's first tourism management plan. It was, uh, it was, we realized was that we had a duty and a responsibility to seek to organize 
to manage for our benefit, for the benefit of those who live and work in the city of Charleston, our tourism industry, and, and to have it, have it grow and be successful, but also have a wonderful quality of life in our city. And now the, the, the challenge of mobility in the 21st century in a very unusual American city. It's unusual because it's a 18th and 19th century city substantially, and because of the preservation movement, and many of you here and those before us who, who kept our buildings from being demolished and, and, and made them desirable places to live and to work. Uh, we're, we're unusual in that our once thriving main street is thriving again. It's active and, and lots of, of people there. We're unusual in that we kept our important civic institutions in the heart of our city where they belong, as great, great cities do. The courthouse is, is here, the judicial center. The federal courthouse is here. Our, our churches have, have substantially remained in, in the city and, and achieved wonderful restoration. The nation's uh, first municipal college to not only not die, but it's thriving and, and, and robust and our medical college, now our great medical university, and so much more. So the, the, it's an unusual challenge, which we welcome, of an 18th and 19th century form city, not pockmarked with lots of vacant lots and, and, and neighborhoods where people don't want to live or don't want to work, whether it's a restoration of the the, the cigar factory or the, the continued, you know, restoration of our uh, dwellings uh, uh, in, the, in our city. Charleston once had, seven, the peninsula once had 71,000 people living here, and we've got 34, 35,000 people now. So we had more people living in this same area than we did. Of course, back then, people used fewer square feet and they didn't have automobiles, um, and lots of things have changed. So, uh, and I thank Tim and Kitty and others for their leadership in pulling this together, and, and uh, Charles Moose, that we, we think of this as, as mobility, how to, to enable us to, to get around uh, those who live here, uh, those who come to work here, those who, who visit here, uh, to move around the city uh, in, in a manner that adds as energy and vitality and, 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 and warmth and, and, and human nature and spirit to the city. And, and at the same time, uh, we're not overwhelmed by the, the machinery that is necessary to do that. And so the city that led the way to historic preservation uh, and tourism management, I'm confident with your input and, and participation will lead the way in the 21st century mobility. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mayor Riley, for your thoughts. And thank you, Historic Charleston Foundation, Charleston Moves, CARTA, and members of the Peninsula uh, Task Force for starting this important dialogue. As Kitty mentioned, my name is William Cogswell, and I will be the moderator here tonight. Uh, we will begin with presentations by our speakers, and we'll follow up with questions and comments from the audience. We'll first hear from Terry Shook, who is a founding partner and principal at the planning and design firm of Shook Kelly, based in Charlotte, North Carolina, in Los Angeles, California. He has done consulting and design work all over the country, and he has considerable experience working here in Charleston. He was also instrumental in getting the light rail and streetcars up and running in Charlotte. Second, we will hear from Rick Williams, who's the executive director of Go Lloyd, a nonprofit transportation management association in Portland, Oregon. Rick also consults on parking and transportation demand management issues for public and private clients throughout North America. Lastly, we will hear from a man who needs no introduction, our own Tim Keene, the Director of Planning, Preservation, and Sustainability for the City of Charleston. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, after the presentations, if you'd like to make, ask a question or make a comment, 
please make your way up to one of the two microphones and, and, and wait to be called on. As I appreciate this issue of mobility is both critical and a highly sensitive subject, I ask that you refrain from screaming and do not throw any sharp objects at the stage. Our goal tonight is to not have this turn into a mixed martial arts cage fight, but to engage in conversation about a vision for the future of transportation in our city, as well as identify certain actions that we can put into effect to bring that vision to reality. So with those ground, ground rules in place, I'm going to ask that Terry Shook come up and give his presentation. Thank you for the introduction, and, and always, um, thanks to Mayor Riley. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to be in this city, and particularly in, in his presence. I um, hope this will work. I'm a, the Mac guy, so I'm always thrown off by these things. Um, as I am now. Um, again, I, I, uh, this is a great quote by uh, a fellow I wish I'd had a chance to know, Leonardo da Vinci, and I think this is true for all of us. All of our knowledge has its origin in our perceptions, and our perceptions are largely informed by our, our experience. And in my case with Charleston, that is so true. I had a chance as a student, of course, in the mid-70s to come and visit this city back, I must say, when it was not as shabby as it might be in this photo, but it was before everything else. It was still a third tier backwater southern city in many ways. And I was fortunate, uh, one of my first projects out of school was the, uh, the old barn part of the Harris Teeter on East Bay Street. And then that led into an opportunity in 1981, really, with uh, then a professor of mine and then partner uh, to do the planning and visioning back in the day for the Visitor Reception and Transportation Center right across the street. Then on that, we decided we would open an office in Charleston, um, uh, down on, right south of the, on Prelio, right south of the Battery, and we determined then and learned that in Charleston, the terms been here's and come here's really has meaning. So most of our work was in the coastal area and very little inside the city, a few historic studies, but that was about it. Then in 2003, I had a chance to come back and work with the city on the NEC plan and consider transportation issues at that time. And then I was uh, instrumental in many ways uh, convincing, and maybe this is good, maybe this is bad, depending on one's perception, in convincing Cherokee to invest significant amounts of money in putting together the land and doing the planning, which is now Magnolia, which I think will ultimately really bear uh, real value for this city, much at the expense of Cherokee's investors. Um, so, Again, a, a great little slice of my experience. But the reality is, of course, Charleston is a 350-year-old city. And if you consider what's happened in Charleston over the length of that time, between the English colony being, you know, swamped by the Spanish, you know, the colonists having to put up, you know, for the Revolutionary War with the Redcoats, a civil war having been fought between the North and the South, and, um, and then all the reconciliations that go along with that during Reconstruction. The fact that there was a great fire, a few people know this, it really burned a big part of the peninsula right at the start of the Civil War. And of course, then the earthquake in the late 1880s. And of course, now you will survive this. This is one of the things, I, trust me, you will survive it. Um, the, um, and then you look at the number of different people and cultures that have come through. The antebellum days of planter and, and slave and the merchant class that shipped off the goods to the markets and ports. The phosphate mining, people don't realize what a big thing that was, but that was once here and now gone, right? The manufacturing that, that attended a lot of the areas along the waterfront too, and the shipping of goods out. And then, of, of course, the fact that Charleston was a shipbuilding center at one time. Who knew, right? All these things, a lot of things that happened in Charleston that aren't here now and aren't part of this city landscape. The great acts of the blue bloods of Charleston to save all these great mansions in town and history. That is your legacy. 
The whole world looks to Charleston in terms of historic preservation. First, of course, came all these tourists from Charlotte and Ohio. They came, and then because of all that acts, then came the Japanese, right, with their cameras. Then, of course, the College of Charleston is now up there. I have friends in Greenwich and New Canaan, and they all want their kids to come, you know, to the College of Charleston. Many of them do, and of course, and you know them at many, in many ways, I probably would add. And then, as Mayor Riley mentioned, the transformation of King Street back into a shopping mecca for all those tourists and, the, and locals as well. What a great thing to have a viable retail Main Street. Places around the country would kill for that. And then, of course, the fact those mansions that were um, saved now are sold at Sotheby's at, like precious stones. And now you have the new techs coming in and the industry of Boeing and the increased shipping that's going to go with the Panama ships coming through with the realigned Panama Canal. All these things are things that are constantly over a 350 year period and many more that proves a great truth that Charleston is indeed a resilient city. For many in our time and place, you don't have that. You only see the things that are in front of you. But this place has seen a lot of changes, and you've managed to accommodate them, I think, pretty well. Other places, I might add, haven't. I remember I had a chance to work in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I was hopeful I was going to see the Louisiana equivalent of Charleston. I was really looking forward to it. I'm a great student of history. And I knew from what I'd seen through old plans that that possibility indeed existed. Of course, when I get there, they had found every way to take advantage, I use the term, advisedly of every public program offered by planners and transportation people to actually obliterate the city. If you want to learn about the history of Baton Rouge, you have to go and read plaques. Google it up. That's all you'll get is a whole series of plaques on the image section of Google. Of course, you, I have to pay tribute to this man. I have, again, um, I think, Mayor Riley, you were in your first term when I had the chance to work on that Harris Teeter. Here we are, both here in this city. And I have watched close and from afar as you have, in my world, you are the best brand steward. If General Motors had only had someone that knew what they were doing as well as you knew about this city, we wouldn't have had the problems of a few years ago. Because you have always known the things you have to protect and cherish and the places you need to give in order to grow a city so that everyone in this city can benefit from it. And that's the important word. This is a city for many people and indeed, it's a city now of the world. And that comes with great challenges and great responsibilities. And sometimes it comes with problems that have to be dealt with. Um, so, and that's why you're here tonight. Because the other great truth is Charleston will continue to be, um, continue to change. It's inevitable. And as has already been mentioned, it is about mobility, just not about transportation. People think to think of these in narrow terms. And I would also posit that when it comes to Charleston's case, mobility needs to be addressed. It needs to be that which is emotionally fueled. I mean, you need to have passion about and the, the, the choices that are put out there. These are not grab a box off the shelf and plug them in because it needs to be culturally relevant. And because of this city, it needs to be very place-based. It needs to be often part of this city. It's going to take time to sort all of these things out, and because they do exist at many levels. Now, my experience in Charlotte, it's interesting. Charlotte's one of those places that was a bombed out city in 1960. It shared more with Baton Rouge than it did Charleston. That's why half of Charlotte on any given weekend is in Charleston. Um, still true. Um, but we, a bunch of us, got together on a grassroots basis and said, perhaps we can change this reality for Charlotte. And we took this impossible area, this abandoned rail line, where Norfolk Southern only ran a train once a year to, to maintain their, their rights. And it, it straddled Charlotte's first streetcar neighborhood that was about 95% white and a 1930s bungalow neighborhood that was about 65, 70% African American. And we said, we can stitch this together and create this great new urban place that many can experience and we can do it around transit. And we did that. We got, found this little trolley car, got it restored, got it running on the tracks. And that then led to the uh, Lynx light rail blue line. Now all this took place over the span of 15, 17 years burned out warehouses, nobody wanted to go there, the cops didn't want to go, and now some of the highest valued real estate in the city, uh, churning big tax dollars into the coffers of the city, but more importantly, it's that mixed-use kind of place that lives in um, 
like uh, a good urban neighborhood should. Not, I would posit, as good as Charleston, but, but still very good. And we're still learning and growing there. And in fact, we're even along this rail line doing something called um, the uh, rail trail, which very much mimics what's being proposed here on the low line for that right of way. We have the transit, now we're doing the park. You'll get your park, and hopefully one of these days you might get transit. Uh, but it's a similar process. Um, a couple of things I want to leave you with to wrap this up, though. A couple of things that I believe I share with you. First off, I'll tell you, I think transportation engineers, if you're in the room, I mean no offense, but I think mostly transportation engineers are false gods. I think they come with a pocket full of solutions that are technically perfect and oftentimes are completely and totally out of step with the expectations of a population in terms of how they want to live, that old term, quality of life. For example, we hit that in, in Charleston. Again, I was the planner for Magnolia. We went through a um, number of series of studies, which was initiated by the city in the early days with the next study of dealing with I-26. I still believe I-26 in that section should be a boulevard. I believe it can be a boulevard. I think there's transportation engineers that will tell you differently. I would challenge that vociferously. I think Charleston needs a front door. You don't need to be one exit off a freeway on the way to Mount Pleasant. That's my opinion. You need a front door. And I think that's the place where a lot of growth that matches up with what you have now in the city can occur. Because this is the area, one of the things I leave you with, those who are concerned about people who come now into the peninsula, the old quarters, and clog your streets, the growth that's going to come to this region needs to be, in how it's done, just as good in, as Charleston. Because if it develops in a more suburban manner, where they don't have good place, they're the first ones to hop in their car come down here. So it's your responsibility, you on the peninsula, to make sure that the development that is within the sphere of influence of the city of Charleston is done in a manner that the neighborhoods are as great and as fine-grained and as mixed use and mixed income as this great city on the peninsula is. I also was the one that brought Rick Lobster here from Market Street Railway in San Francisco when we found these two old trolley cars, street cars that were Charleston's, and they sat out there, Magnolia for the longest time, those are two of San Francisco cars on the bottom. Um, uh, now, I will tell you, I and some other partners, we have those cars, we moved them to Charlotte. We intend to use them there, but if something happens here, we'll be more than happy to help facilitate them coming back home where they belong. But we rescued them and they are now in Charlotte for another initiative that we're planning. Uh, second one is, you need to protect your urban armature at all cost. We agree with everyone who wants to protect the character of these streets. We think there's strategies to do that. I'm not going to go into it here. It'll be part of the discussion. Rick will have even more things to add about that, but that's an absolute. It's immutable. Another part of this that we think, as I said about the development, you need to leverage and interpret the DNA of Charleston in all the new development that you do. That's an extremely important thing to consider. Uh, one thing we did at Magnolia, which is accessible, we actually did a brand DNA for Charleston. Why do people love this place so much? Invested a ton of research and did a publication that uh, at the time, and hopefully it will continue, you need to make sure it does, when Magnolia is developed, that it follows this brand DNA of Charleston. We define what makes Charleston great, what makes this genuine place the place people want to come to. So we did a whole menu, you might say, of things that would need to be that development uh, in, I would say, in Magnolia and any other places that are potential development, redevelopment areas within the city. If you're going to achieve a kind of place that was a rendering of Magnolia, to put that kind of place there where people might stay there instead of coming out here and clogging up your streets. Fourth, we want you to seek mobility choices that are aspirationally grounded. That is to say they need to catch people emotionally. And there's two ways to do that. There's two different kinds of strategies. There should have been an, e after, an S after that E. Um, there's push strategies and there's pull strategies. The push strategies are when you do fixed transit and you develop great neighborhoods around them, such as we did in South Bend, as you'll hear Rick talk about in Portland. Those are very important, but there's also new pull strategies out there with these phones. If you travel to cities and you, you've used Uber, where you go and take this hit this phone, hit an app, and a car comes and picks you up and takes you where you want to go. You've already paid for it through your credit card. And so it's point to point. It doesn't depend upon fixed structure. It doesn't need parking. The cars never park. These are the new things. 
it's new and emerging. People say, oh, it'll never happen. That's a George Jetson idea. Well, folks, these computers and these things didn't exist 20 years ago. Uber in 18 months has become a phenomenon that's happening. And you talk to the automobile people, they will tell you, just as we know, the, driver, the horseless carriage became the automobile. Now we're having the driverless car. Right on the heels of that will be something else that will be directed to where people won't even want to own a car. We know this in terms of rates of people, kids getting all kinds of things in terms of not getting driver's license. Even some of the magazines are writing these articles, why won't Johnny drive? It's really funny. So push is about government solutions that are framed in specific ways, directing land growth, providing transit modalities. And the other is about consumers. They're pulling the goods and services and information they demand for their needs in the transit world. Both of those strategies are part of what you need to do. And lastly, I'll leave you with this. It is about establishing an involved and extended community dialogue. It's not, there's no easy solutions here. We learned that with the VRTC when we did that process. This is, by the way, a fellow I got to know. He's no longer yes on council, Jimmy Gallant. I remember when he was, he worked with us in terms of Magnolia. And he said the best thing about that process, he said, normally when big entities come to us, they bring us a cake. And maybe it's a good cake. Maybe it's a, but they don't ask us whether we want chocolate, vanilla, strawberry cake. This time, we're getting the ingredients, and we'll make this cake together. I've never forgotten that quote, and I think it's a quote that applies to this process. This is a community effort. People have to come together. Everyone's interests have to be heard, and you do that patiently. You'll find the way to solve many of these problems that are right in your face today. Thank you. Wow, that was the hardest part. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name's Rick Williams. Um, I'm the executive director of Go Lloyd in Portland, Oregon. And uh, I, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be here. Just a real quick, and people who are with me today have heard this for the third time, but I come from the West Coast, and I had a wonderful dinner the other night with Tom Bradford and his wife, Susan, and I realized I was sitting in a house that was older than my state. And it just put the whole thing in perspective for me. What a wonderful city you have, what a wonderful history you have. My job today is to tell you about how we solve the problem for growth um, in a district in Portland, Oregon. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of sense of um, process, uh, a little bit of a sense of um, frame of mind and um, approach, and a little bit of a sense of a partnership that you need to put together to solve that type of a problem. I'll lead off by saying is that Portland is not Charleston. And uh, we don't pretend to be, and Charleston is not Portland. But hopefully you'll find things in, in my presentation today that you can apply to solving your problem, uh, or at least identifying it and, and moving forward with a, a program or a strategy to deal with growth and, and make it, as um, Terry said, fit your DNA. Um, real quickly, uh, the Lloyd District, where I'm from, is one of five central city business districts in Portland. Uh, it's a residential neighborhood business district. Um, we have five of them. We're just east of the downtown across the river called the Willamette, uh, but most people who are not from Portland would call it the Willamette. Um, we're not, we're a, a small district, 275 acres, but we now have 23,000 employees um, in that 275 acres. Um, and we are very constrained, maybe like the peninsula. We have two freeways on either side of us, but we only have one access point off of each of those freeways into our district, both in or out, so we're very constrained. On the northern edge of our district, you'll notice um, that is uh, very high density, historic residential neighborhoods. Um, so if you were just to extend our boundary three blocks to the north, our residential population would be somewhere near 10,000. Um, but because they're in a different district, we don't count them. We have about uh, 3,000 residents in our district right now. Also, the Lloyd District is interesting uh, because we're a very diverse district. Uh, we have the largest shopping mall in the state of Oregon located in our district. Um, I wish I could point this. Um, it's on the eastern boundary of our district, uh, 1.5 million square feet of retail. 
Um, we have 23,000 commercial employees. Uh, we have the convention center on the west side of the district that does about 40 conventions a year and brings in about 2 million visitors. The mall brings in about 20 million visitors a year. We also are home to the Portland Trailblazers and the Moda Center, formerly called the Rose Garden, and hopefully the Blazers are still going to keep going with San Antonio. Um, so we have an entertainment district, lots of hotels. Uh, and so we're very constrained um, and we're very diverse. Um, and uh, what we want to do is, um, through Go Lloyd, we formed a nonprofit business association uh, to um, basically coordinate a vision for the district and a vision that uh, came together both with the public and the private sector in the room. We're a nonprofit, um, but our focus is on, we're no different than a chamber of commerce, but our focus is on economic development, vitality of our district, but we have a laser focus with transportation. We believe that if we don't have good access and good options, we can't achieve um, the vision that we have for jobs, housing, and visitor growth in our district. Uh, and so Go Lloyd is very focused, but we're still very much uh, a business association and a residential uh, association representing the people who live, work, and play in our district. We're also a service delivery organization. We have transit programs that we run through our uh, uh, partnership. Uh, we have a bike network that we own uh, in the district. We all have over 100 bicycle locker facilities uh, that you can rent uh, from Go Lloyd, and we actually pay for them and put them onto private properties. Um, so um, we also deliver services as well as advocate for change. Couple pictures, in 1994, it's in black and white because it was that dismal. Uh, we had lots of surface lots and um, uh, not a lot of, uh, of dense development. You can see in 2014, that's a picture of today, things are starting to fill in uh, and the growth has been phenomenal. But this is where we want to go and this is where the problem began. In 1997, we sat down and said that we want to double the employment in the Lloyd District, more than double, from 17,000 employees to 40,000 employees, and put them into that 275 acres. We wanted to increase our housing supply by 500 percent to 5,500 residential units, which would bring in 7,500 new residents to the Lloyd District. And we wanted to add 11 million square feet of new development uh, into the Lloyd District. Uh, and even though we had lots of visitors, we wanted 5 million more. And we wanted to accomplish that by 2035. The problem was is how we were accessing the district. So we took that, those goals and translated them into jobs, visitors, housing units, and then put them into a transportation model. And I apologize for this because I created this graph, and I'm not very graphically able. I'm challenged that way. But in 1997, 72% of everybody who came to the Lloyd District came in a drive-alone vehicle. And only 10% came by transit, and less than 1% walked, and less than 1% biked. And then 16% came by carpool, which was great, but that was an, still uh, a load on the parking system and the transportation system. So we just took 20,000 new jobs and overlaid it onto the grid. And this is what happened. The red blob is gridlock. And so what we did is we said, boy, that vision is great, but it won't work. It will shut down. Uh, it would require us to build 15,000 new parking stalls to accommodate uh, the parking demand at those access modes. That uh, would have translated into uh, about 73 acres of land if it was in surface parking or 18 800 stall parking facilities. So our job was to say, do we still want to do this vision and is it, is it actually even achievable? So this is where we began. So we had some soul searching to do. And we said, the status quo has to be challenged. So then we ask ourselves, how do we take that model that you just saw and make it work so that we can put all of that in? And what we realized and learned is we would have to take our drive alone rate from 72% to 33%. We would have to raise our transit usage from 10% to 42%. Biking and walking would have to go to 10% and 5% respectively. And we actually were going to drop the carpool rate from 16% to 10% to reduce the impact of their cars onto the supply. So it was a significant transition from transit to biking. And even if we achieved that goal, we still had a 24% increase in peak hour traffic, simply because of the sheer growth in the number of people coming to the district. So we went from a level of service C in 1997, achieved the goal, and we would still be at a level of service D 
with F being gridlock. So that was our challenge uh, that was ahead of us. So we decided we had to do something about it, and we formed the partnership called Go Lloyd that brought in uh, major business leaders, uh, neighborhoods, those three, those neighborhoods that border the district participated. Uh, we brought in uh, our city commissioner, who uh, the mayor knows, who is now Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Um, we had the director of transportation, the director of planning, and uh, the city commissioner of transportation on our partnership. And so we had to bring leadership into the room, and we adopted those goals. They became city policy, and they became the um, operating modus operandi, so to speak, of the business community. Everybody agreed, from the public sector to the private sector, that status quo meant we all had to change the way we were doing business. Employers could no longer accept the fact that their employees would drive alone to work in, and get free parking. The transit agency had to realize that the fare products that they were selling us in 1997 only got us a 10% market share. That had to change. And the city of Portland had to realize that the code itself was creating the problem because it was requiring more parking. It was requiring the amount of parking that we needed. And what was being required was being filled up by a 72% drive alone rate. It was a self-fulfilling property pro uh, prophecy. Everybody had to change. And we all had to agree to do it. In other words, we were all culpable. Everybody was on the hook. It wasn't the city saying, oh, the business sector, you need to build it this way, or the transit agency saying, you guys just need to buy more transit passes. Everybody was culpable. Also, we monetized it. So to get to that, remember back in 1997 when we had the 72% drive alone rate and the 10% transit rate, that would require 15,680 parking stalls to be built. I told you about that. But that was $470 million drag on development. So the private sector had to pick up that cost if they wanted to try to figure out first how they were going to build the 18 parking garages or take out the 73 acres of land, tearing down old buildings to bring new buildings in. Um, so our shift, if we met our goal, would uh, result in a, still a very significant drag, $222 million in parking costs just to achieve our goal. But that's a $248 million savings. Now, since we've done that, in the last 10 years, we've added 8,000 jobs to the Lloyd District. And we now have, on the very far right-hand column, a transit mode split of 38%. We have a drive alone rate of 41%. Our ride share has come down to our goal of 10, and biking is up to 8%. Uh, what that has done and translated into is um, about $90 million in savings already on the 8,000 employees that we have brought to the district because we didn't build them 2,672 parking stalls. We were able to put them in other modes and reinvest a portion of that $90 million savings in other things like transit, employee transit passes, infrastructure, and a new streetcar system. A lot of people would say, you're crazy, that's going to kill the economic vitality of the district. You've got to let the market do what the market does. Um, the ratio of parking to land use in the Lloyd District now is 1.4 parking stalls per 1,000 square feet. When we started this process, it was 3.5 stalls per 1,000 square feet. We have less parking today in the Lloyd District, stalls-wise, than we did in 1997. The value of our properties have increased 55%. Everybody's property value has gone up. And, which means where our lease rates are up. Also, if you think taking away free parking is going to take uh, business away, our building occupancy rate for commercial and, and retail is 96%. We have a 4% vacancy rate, and we held that through the recession. So reinvesting the cost of savings into alternative modes is the direction that we went. But so what did we have to do? What were the key strategies we had to implement? No parking minimums. We eliminated parking requirements for all development, residential and commercial, in uh, 1997. And we also implemented, though, parking maximums that were correlated to our mode split goals. So the maximum amount of parking you can build, whether it's retail or office in the Lloyd District, is two stalls per 1,000 square feet. And the maximum amount of parking you can build for residential is 1.35 stalls per unit. And so we capped everything because we correlated it to the out goal. And we pushed it. And then we made other investments then 
in, the, in alternative modes, biking, transit, and uh, walking. Um, there's no free parking. We had to agree, and our partners in the partnership agreed, that we unbundled all commercial parking. Uh, used to bundle the cost of parking into the lease rate. That's no longer allowed in the Lloyd District. You have to bear the cost of the parking. Um, and uh, we took away all the on-street parking. It was, it was free. We put charges in, in for all on-street parking. All off-street commer commercial parking and commuter parking now is unbundled from lease rates. We also created a unique transit fare product. Right now, a monthly pass in the Lloyd District, if you're an employee, is $1,000 a year. Uh, not a monthly pass, an annual transit pass is $1,000 a year. If you buy it from Go Lloyd and you agree to buy one of those passes for every one of your employees on site, we'll give it to you for $300 per employee per year because there's no way we can get a 42% transit mode split if our employees have to pay $100 a month for transit, but they only have to pay zero for parking. But that was something we in the business community had to agree to, is that we had to see the trade-off. But because we adopted out goals, 33%, 42%, 10% biking, the conversation was always not around, this is going to be problematic. The conversation was always around, what are the programs and strategies that we have to implement to meet those goals? We didn't begin with solutions, we began with goals. And then we let the strategies define the solution. We let the goals define the solution. And uh, if anybody raised their hands and said, I'm not comfortable with this, then we would say, let's go back and revisit the goals. 11 million square feet, 20,000 new jobs, and 5,500 new residential units. We also had to get the ball rolling. We had five major corporations and businesses step up as premier partners and agree to a three-year process to where they would invest in transit and biking in their businesses for three years to see how it went. And then after three years, we would reevaluate. We now have 85 premier partners in the district um, investing in transit and investing in biking in their business. All partners are investing in the vision plan, the public sector and the private sector, and now we have Goloid staff who's delivering programs and services on a daily basis. We started with me working half time, we now have a staff of five and a budget of nearly a million dollars. So factors for success. A unifying transportation challenge. Define the problem and hang some numbers on it. Vision. We wanted to meet the vision and we tested the vision against the model and we gave people a, a, an opportunity to step back from the vision and downsize that. Maybe it's not 20,000 jobs, let's do five. But our leadership group stayed with the vision and so we kept moving forward. Leadership, we had the right people in the room. Uh, the commissioners were there, uh, the business community was there. The people that were in the room that, that were the people that could commit their organizations. Commissioner Blumenauer could commit the Transportation Bureau. Major property owners could commit their corporations to do these things. And so the leadership was there. Goal setting, I already talked a lot about that. And then the strategic organizational approach is to have a single coordinating forum called Go Lloyd that keeps the partnership together and makes sure, one, everybody's on track and that we're measuring and monitoring the outcomes on a yearly basis. So why does it work? We think it's a return on investment. I think, like I said already, we think we've saved $90 million for our, uh, our partners and we've begun to reinvest it. Everybody has skin in the game. As I said before, we're all culpable in how we got here, so we all have to be a partner in how we're going to get there. And that was very important. We have seen marked reductions in, re in, co in congestion in our district. In fact, we've taken 4,000 employees out of the parking supply. So we've created 4,000 parking stalls that we now give to our visitors and our customers without building any parking. Overall, we've built less parking. We manage higher uh, than necessary parking development costs. We've reduced the cost burden on the private sector as they move forward in development. We've minimized the displacement of land that could have been in parking that's now in commercial office and new residential developments. We just built a 650, we're currently building a 650 uh, unit market rate apartment uh, complex in the Lloyd District at 0.6 stalls per unit. And underneath it we have 650 stall bike hub we have, more parking stall, we have more bike parking stalls on the site than we do uh, car stalls, and it's LEED Platinum. Uh, and we've improved the markability of the district. Our customers are asking for this. They're asking, I want to lease space from you, or I want to live in an apartment. What kind of bike facilities do you have? What kind of walking amenities do you have? Uh, we're getting less and less uh, uh, 
caught up in the, in the discussion of parking. And we've lowered the transportation costs for our employees and our employers. It's a better place to work and it's a better place to live. So with that, I would just say what we're trying to do, and I guess our message from Lloyd District would, would be um, we can't be building with what we know today. We need to be building with what we want to happen in the future. And then we all need to hold hands together as a partnership, define a goal, define a vision, hold hands, and then jump off the dock together. And I think that's what we did in the Lloyd District, and I think it's paying off um, both um, environmentally as well as economically. So thank you. Do I just keep going from here, Winslow? Flipping through these slides, Is my, are mine on here? They're not on here. I'm sorry? I thought they were all on one file. Okay, my main goal is to go fast, so I'm going to present a lot of information and then I will clarify or, or backtrack actually in Q&A in some cases. This is King Street in 1949, um, and this was not Christmas Day, this, there was no special event, there was not graduation at the College of Charleston, it was just a day on King Street, and you look at the traffic here. Um, I show this slide to say that, that this is an, I, I feel like this is an amazing opportunity that this community has right now to, to to solve problems that not many small cities have in America. And, and I think we have to approach it in the right way. And I think the right way for us is to not think about this as a, as, as a challenge of reducing congestion. You know, I think if we go into this and say our goal is to reduce congestion, we will be frustrated forever and we will achieve nothing. So we cannot start this conversation this way. This photograph. Uh, in 1949, this is the population of the city. The high watermark, as the mayor mentioned, was 1940 when there were 71,000 people. So that picture was taken in 1949, just before we fell off the cliff and population on the peninsula, people went to the suburbs. This chart also shows our goals for population on the peninsula, which I'll get into more in a minute, but we expect and hope that more people will live on the peninsula in the future that this is a dynamic city, it's not just for vi visitors. More people will live here, more people will work here, and, and the city will grow. And um, so this is kind of where we see the population heading, just on the topic of not so much about reducing congestion. This is a chart that shows traffic counts on our main streets on the peninsula between 2002 and, and 2012. So this is Calhoun, uh, Broad, Meeting, King, you don't see dramatic increases here. There's actually only a couple of places where there are dramatic increases in traffic downtown, and those are where the bridge changes occurred. So you had new traffic patterns associated with getting on and off the bridge. Otherwise, it's a pretty stable level of uh, traffic on our main streets. And that may be unbelievable to you, and I'll come back to the, 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 the peak hour type issues that we have in Charleston that are unique, but really, if you look at it, there's a kind of stabilization of traffic on our streets on the peninsula as opposed to at the edge of the region. So this is, this is the freeways, the highways, and, and the increment on this chart is 10,000 trips versus 5,000 in the last one. So what we've seen in the region is that the, the, the traffic counts on our highways, 26, I-5, 26, has gone up dramatically in the tens of thousands of trips per year at the edges. Um, so people are living further away, they're driving longer distances to work and other things, so the, the big highways are getting much more congestion and much more traffic. If it's not about reducing congestion, what is it about? I think what we need to concentrate on is, is, is how we want to live on the peninsula. And, and the challenge for us, I think, is that more and more people can live on the peninsula without a car or more and more people that live on the peninsula don't have to drive so much, don't have to drive as far, have other options for how they get around. That, that this is about how we live on the peninsula and that we have many options for how we get around rather than concentrating on trying to reduce congestion. 
Regarding the population growth, these are modest goals. I mentioned this 25,000 additional people over the next 15 years or so. All I'm saying is that Charleston has had a population within the city of Charleston that's roughly equivalent to around 20% of the region. The region's going to get, and this is a chart that shows other cities. New York City has over 35% of their region in the city of New York. Atlanta, on the low end, has about 10% of its region within the city of Atlanta. What we're suggesting with these projections is that if we maintain a level of about 20% in the city, that would put the city's population at 200,000 when the region gets to a million, which projections are it'll get there in about 15 years. So if there were 200,000 people in all of the city of Charleston and the peninsula was to remain about what it is today to the city, which is 30% of the population, that would put 60,000 people on the peninsula. Again, we had 71,000 in 1940. The college is bigger, the hospitals are bigger, things have changed, um, but that seems like a, a, a worthy goal that not everyone that comes to Charleston lives in remote places and drives, but that more, more people are living on the peninsula. Another thing to mention is that the employment on the peninsula has gone down a little bit um, over the last 10 or so years. Well, from about 2000 to 2011, employment went down a little bit during the recession, it was the heart of that, and we do, want our goal to be more employment on the peninsula, we think about 10,000 more jobs over the next 15 years, which would put us in the area of 45 or so thousand jobs in the peninsula. That's, that's an important part of this as well, more employment on the peninsula. So if we had 25,000 or so more uh, people on the peninsula, that would equate to about 12,000 new housing units. So this is our plan map for the peninsula. The question, I guess, is where, where do we grow on the peninsula? Um, and it's, it's, it's probably mostly these areas in red here, and I'll come back to them in a minute. Um, because as we grow, it's not about just growing for growth's sake, of course, it's about growing the community and everything about the community that makes it a great place to live. These are the parks in the peninsula, that means we'll need to have more of them um, to, to accommodate more people here and in new places on the peninsula. Within the existing neighborhoods, which is in this map, the yellow areas, you know, it's going to be modest growth. We know this. There's, you know, lot here and lot there, uh, smaller scale development, uh, redevelopment, infill type things. You're not going to accommodate a tremendous amount of the, the new people in the existing neighborhoods. We're protective and preserving those. So we come back to these red areas. It's Horizon. It's the Union Pier area. It's what I call the Skirt Courier Square District, Upper Meeting and King. It's the Upper Peninsula on Morrison Drive and Meeting Street. It's Magnolia. So those are the areas where you have to grow. The other challenge, I think, is in the, in the, the, I'm going to talk about a, a few things we work on as it comes to mobility and giving us choices. The first is to, to build a public transportation system that becomes a real alternative to the car. We have to use these streets, our primary streets, um, Meeting, King, East Bay, Morrison, Calhoun, Columbus, and so forth which can pretty well connect these growth areas, but also connect to our neighborhoods. The challenge is that we have very, very narrow streets. These streets were built in the 18th and 19th century, as the mayor mentioned. They are a challenge like not many other cities, because to make public transportation a real alternative to the car, we have to carve out some of this 44 feet. This is the width of Meeting Street from curb to curb between Columbus and Calhoun Street, 44 feet. Each lane of travel needs 11 feet at least um, for the cars. So in order to find space for public transportation on these main streets, that becomes a real alternative to, to driving. I mean, if the bus is in the traffic, why not just drive? I mean, you know, for, for those that can. Now, the buses do provide a service, and if you can't drive, then we very happy they're there. But if we're growing and more people are to use the bus, they're not just going to use it you know, if it's in traffic, I don't think. So we've got to carve out some of this 44 feet for some form of public transportation. Maybe it's trolleys. This is the old trolley map of Charleston. Um, so maybe it is. This is the Charlotte version of the trolley. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about technologies or suggest which one it is. This is the old trolley in Charlotte and the new light rail line they've built, uh, the streetcar in, in, in uh, New Orleans, the uh, streetcar, the new streetcar in Portland. Maybe it's just an electric bus of some kind, you know, that we, we, we carve space out for in our streets. There's many cities that are using different versions of smaller, electric, clean, quiet buses that can move faster because they've dedicated lanes to them. That may be what it is here. 
And then you could connect the downtown area because we're not the only part of this region to other places like West Ashley using bus rapid transit, connecting to centers in the suburbs, whether it's West Ashley where you've got Citadel Mall and the West Ashley Circle, could be places in Mount Pleasant, the north area, that using something like bus rapid transit connecting to the peninsula where you've got a good on-street um, system of, of dedicated lanes for public transportation. We do track pedestrian counts. These are ones that we took recently and then back in 2010. And, and I think there's no doubt that the pedestrian activity in the peninsula is increasing dramatically. This chart happens to show uh, lower pedestrian counts on Upper King Street, which is counterintuitive, but I'll tell you they were taken between noon and 2 p.m., not 1 a.m. Um, but, but, you know, you see it, and, and everybody talks about how much more pedestrian activity there is in the city. We need to do more about that. The bike population on the peninsula has gone up dramatically in the last 10 years. There's no question about that. Um, we are this month taking proposals to implement a bike share program on the peninsula, so that will be done this year. So some of this, in terms of providing other options for people, isn't something we have to wait a long time for. Um, bike share will be coming to Charleston very soon. Other technologies, uh, uh, Tech Terry was talking about the Uber world and, and other, um, you know, car sharing uh, systems that exist. Certainly this is, has great applicability in Charleston. Um, two last things I'll mention and then we can get into the questions. One is that we do feel like there's, there's this situation as it relates to parking on the peninsula, that really we have been resistant to permit more parking south of Calhoun Street for quite some time. We continue to resist that and don't feel like we should be adding a lot of parking in structured parking south of Calhoun Street because you're into the oldest part of the historic district. North of Calhoun up to the Crosstown, we do feel, especially Upper King Street, there's some, there's some need for a little bit of additional public parking in that area just to get to some minimum threshold to provide for the daily life of people working and living there but limited amount, strategically located. But the most of it, we think, in terms of new parking, needs to be in more remote locations where people are not having to drive into the city, parking remotely, getting on transit and getting into the city. And not this is King Street a couple Saturdays ago. Again, not a particularly special day, but the cars were backed up. We have these weak, weak peak per, weird peak periods, of course, unlike most cities, people coming in for entertainment or dinner or farmer's market. and. So we have to deal with that unique condition in Charleston. And another thing about, about living without a car is that it may not be fairway market, but, but that we have services closer to people, that you don't have to drive as far. This is a big issue, land use, development, how the city grows physically, that we're getting services closer to people. You don't have to drive to James Island or, or Mount Pleasant or somewhere to get more services. They're closer to your house, even if it's another Harris Teeter or some other grocery store or other services, and that is the end of my presentation. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Tim and Terry and Rick for those uh, insightful comments. Now we have the fun part of the, uh, the night, the questions and answers. Um, and just to get things going, I'm going to pull rank and start with the first question. Um, and this really is, I would say, to, to the entire panel, uh, and, and um, it's actually a two-part question, so bear with me for a second, um, if I can read my handwriting. Uh, as Charleston continues to grow, how can we accommodate the movement of people in a way will, that will have the least impact on its longtime residents? And second, given that the peninsula's uh, current residents amount to such a relatively small percentage of the city's total population, uh, and especially a small percentage of the region's total population, why should somebody on Daniel Island or James Island care about the traffic issues and the mobility issues downtown? First question. I think I would even it would even frame it the other way. Is that um, instead of instead of uh, trying to go from the negative, go from the positive. One thing I would say that that uh, growth will will do is that uh, it will it will allow the system to become more robust. 
I think it'll make it, if you're looking at, I said, the, the push type technologies, the things that are infrastructure based, those are the ones that, uh, you know, in and in when you have more people, they become more useful. You know, we know this in life, that sometimes it's a, it's a question, the old term economies of scale. So I think actually it's something, you get to that point, it benefits the existing residents. It, it's not trying to mitigate. The other thing I would certainly true when you look at the new services that are appearing like overnight, uh, such as Uber and the ones that will follow that, um, you know, when we get into the more, they call it the driverless car now, it's funny, you used to have the horseless carriage, remember we came to the automobile, well the driverless car will become something else, that's the first part of this technological wave. And um, it'll be here in the next, you know, 15 to 20 years, full blown. That again, robust systems mean that the systems uh, work more efficiently for, for everyone. And I think that uh, you're going through this phase. And of course, um, I think, you know, Rick has some comments about uh, the things in terms of, of, of parking and what you can do now, perhaps, to mitigate some of those things. I think my answer to the question is there's two ways to approach it. Uh, one, you need to involve everybody in the discussion. Um, because otherwise, you're, paying, you're playing parking triage. And um, it's really having to decide what are the highest priorities for the public right of way. Um, and oftentimes, again, these are the hard questions we have to have. I know when I live in Portland, I don't own the parking space in front of my house. Um, that's a law. I may not like it, um, but I agree with it. Um, and what we're trying to do is maximize the street system at the times it's best to do so. And the only way to do that is to get everybody in the discussion. We, we had, uh, again, the historic neighborhoods that uh, abutted our district very involved because they were very much in fear of that growth plan. Uh, they didn't like the vision. 11 million square feet of new development, 23,000 employees, 5,500 new residential units. Well, they're all just going to park in my neighborhood because you guys don't like parking. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we, we enumerated their concerns. Define the problem. Is it 85% of your, uh, your block face of your uh, neighborhood streets full? Is that a problem? Is it 90%? Is it in the evening? Or is it on the weekends? And we began to then say, if our plan goes forward and we exceed those thresholds, then we'll agree to do other types of strategies up to and including where we were going to pay residents for their permits and even consider prohibiting any other parking than residential parking in certain areas. But what's interesting, 20 years later, not one of the, re the neighborhoods who participated in our program have come forward and said that we've tripped any of those thresholds. The key was to be able to define the problem. Uh, and I, so I think I don't have a great answer to that question, but it's process, goals, targets, milestones, and then a system of measurement so that we can sit down and have a reasonable conversation with each other. Um, because uh, again, um, everybody has a different definition of the problem, so you need to kind of find consensus on that. So, so Tim, uh, you probably are the best um, you know, person to answer this question. Tell us why uh, what's going on in the peninsula is relevant and important to our, the larger community, the macro economy. Well, I think everybody in this room knows the answer to that question. I mean, I, the only thing I'd say about it really is that w one thing that we're missing in this region is, and I feel people don't, aren't, don't feel connected to a conversation about how their life is going to change as it relates to mobility and how they'll have better access to public transportation. What, what I'm getting at is we, we don't have a regional plan for, for public transportation. And, and we really have to have that. I mean, we, we can talk about the peninsula and it's very important and this is useful and all that, but we have to show people in West Ashley and Mount Pleasant and North area how we'll all connect to each other and how people will move around this region. And, and, and Carter really needs that for the next conversation that we have about public transportation in this region because we have to be working on this. No one ever builds public transportation systems unless everybody in, in the, or there's a big consensus in the region to get them done. All right, so are there any questions from the audience? We have one here. 
Yeah, hi. Thanks a lot for organizing this forum tonight. Um, the Low Country Graduate Center is already actively working with the Citadel uh, together with the College of Charleston and MUSC to develop a program of study to tackle some of the challenges that you all have raised tonight. And I just wonder, based on your experiences, what skill sets and knowledge do you feel would be most valuable to those who are working on the public infrastructure and urban planning as we go forward? Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> go ahead, Brett. I'll give it a shot. That's a tough question. Uh, one, I think it's really great that you're using uh, students uh, who are the future. Uh, we're blessed in Portland to have Portland State University right in our downtown. Um, and we have a school of urban planning there that's one of the best in the country. And so we've actually um, worked with Portland State University to do uh, capstone projects in the Lloyd District, using the Lloyd District as a test case for any number of things, from a residential development to a commercial development, uh, or where a bike lane should go. And let them tell us. Uh, so one, it's great to have their innovation. I think other skill sets, one is just uh, youth. Uh, a, so a real quick one we learned the other day is like um, more than 50% of 18-year-olds in the state of Washington have yet to get their driver's license. So their view of the world is different than ours. And so I would say a skill set is the youth. The other skill set, uh, I think um, to a certain degree, uh, Terry kind of alluded to it, is technical knowledge. Um, I don't understand the app, but my son, sons, would understand the app. So I think it's youth, it's um, vision, uh, let them go wild on a topic, uh, because they also sometimes give you political cover, because <laughs> to have you know Portland State University say, hey, you should have a bike lane on this street, and here's why, or you should do this with your code, here's why, uh, it, it's, yeah. it's great, because you're, you're arguing with the people who it will apply to. In One the other thing I would say too, as an architect, and sometimes I get in trouble with this, even though I'm a fellow with AIA, I sometimes build myself as the anti-architect. And, and I consider myself these days more an applied cultural anthropologist. And I think that for just, you know, people who are being trained to, to tackle these kinds of, of issues, uh, they need to have a, a, a clear understanding that, that great cities have many different people with many different ideas and many stations in life. That's what make them great and make them vibrant. And uh, if, if we could, as architects, the old Howard Dork model, if we could just live between our own ears and come out with these great things and make the world great, it would have happened a long time ago that the true great ones are about, are about process and engagement. And it's very messy. All right, thank you. Great, we're gonna, thanks. We're gonna take a question on the far end. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate the panel on bringing up some incredibly important um, issues and insights. I've learned, learned a lot tonight. I want to particularly compliment Tim on his photo behind him, King Street. Um, I was in Copenhagen a few years ago, and Jan Geller showed me a similar photo of Strojit in downtown Copenhagen, taken in about the same time, 1960, 1958. Looked just like that. Cars everywhere. You go to Strojit now in downtown Copenhagen, it's a beautiful, pedestrian, lively place, not, not a car in sight. If you go there without knowing that, uh, as, a, as a tourist, you say, well, it's always been this way. Copenhagen has always been this way. It must have always never had cars downtown, but they had pictures just like that. Now, Rick said we need to hold our hands and jump off the dock and take a leap of faith. So my question, I guess, or comment or question is, you know, King Street ha is closed once a, a month on Sunday. I understand from Brooks Brothers and others it's the big, biggest day of their, of their month. How do we convince those merchants to take that leap and close down King Street to pedestrians and make it a strojit of Copen like Copenhagen for Charleston? How do we do that? Rick? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from here, so I can say anything I want, right? Just no, jump I, the dock. I, I, um, I, I didn't mean that, Rick. No, I'm okay. sorry. The, the, um, you know, uh, there's lots of different opinions about that. I mean, in, I'll, I'll say in general, the city has been resistant to closing streets permanently just because when that's been done, I, I mean, we've been concerned that we don't have the density and kind of 
intensity of use that you have in a, in a place like Copenhagen to, to support not having some level of, of vehicle movement through the street. And you see that in American cities, State Street in Chicago, other places that close the street to vehicle travel. And then later on, they said, I'll bring the vehicles back because things kind of died out without the cars there, even to some degree. So there's that side of it. I mean, I think we'd really need to study it and, and maybe look at, at, at ways to increase the activity level in that zone, which creates another set of issues. Um, but I also say that there is a lot of resistance from merchants and, and, and and lower King Street or middle King Street to, to closing the street permanently to. And I think it's one of those things, and we talked a lot today because we had sessions all day today about doing little things and then seeing how that goes and then expanding it from there and expanding it from there. And it may be one of those kind of things. We, you know, keep working on this and, and maybe that expands. And I, I definitely think one way or another we're going to have to expand the idea of these narrow streets that we have. There's going to be less space for them for cars if there's going to be more space for pedestrians, bikes, transit, and those kinds of things. So, so I think it's, what did we call it today? Rapid incrementalism, Rapid incrementalism. Is, 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 is part of what we need to be working on here. I'll just say that very few retail streets in America ever uh, survive, much less thrive, without traffic and on-street parking. Uh, uh, it's, it's a question of, of urban densities. Um, you know, you, you have you have you know certain examples in Europe where you have urban densities that support it, but as a long term strategy I would really caution you to go that route. There's a prominent strategy. Take a question over on the left side. Yes, Charleston has a history of um, using the waterways, and we, we're blessed with a web of water that goes all throughout uh, to several of the suburban suburbs and um, one of the things I've, I've been talking about is trying to find a way not only to use the waterways as we're seeing with the water taxi for public transportation, but for personal transportation. And I also want to add, we don't know um, what kind of personal transportation is going to be invented in the future. I've saw some amazing things in Vegas where a fold up electric uh, vehicle where people are using in the streets. So uh, to prepare for that, so my two questions would be, is, Judging by other cities, how are other cities using their waterways? And Charleston's history would be, it would be a wonderful thing for us to use that. And how we, you know, maybe some ideas on that. And the other idea is how can we plan for um, personal transportation vehicles for the future? Well, you know, waterways, it is, it is great. It's one of those great magical things. I did some consulting in Sydney, Australia one time and stayed on an island at their Manly Island, commuted every day in the work with, with hydrofoils into the Sydney Opera House. I mean, that's a great way to start your day. Um, uh, I, you don't have, you know, I think uh, the problem is I think, I think water in certain places, you can speak of it in terms of, you know, the Pacific Northwest, they still make use of, of, uh, of a ferry service in a very big way. It's one of those things that roads compete with it. Um, so I really don't, uh, you know, have much, um, you know, say about that. In terms of the other technologies, though, I will say this: that I do think, as as we say, these uh, we had a very good conversation around that. One of the other gentlemen, from MIT's transportation department today, echoed some of the themes I had and added to it about, you know, the technologies, uh, the the uh, the computerized cars and and the uh, and the uh, dispatch, uh, you know, uh, consumer-driven dispatch services like Uber and Lyft and some of the others that will quickly come after that will will radically change the way that, uh, that our generation, me, I use Uber in big cities all over the country when I travel, it's default. I mean, I can't remember a time now when I didn't have it. It's only been around for 18 months. It's really bizarre. Um, and uh, that th these are the kinds of things that, that aren't infrastructure driven. I mean, they work on the roads you have. They'll, they, they're okay with narrow lanes. You know, it's not like an engineered solution. We have to come in and pay for it for two generations and wait, you know, 20 years for it to appear. I, I want to do a quick poll of the audience. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot about Uber, and, and I was introduced to it personally uh, in D.C. about six months ago. I learned today that it's been capitalized at over $2 billion. Uh, Google's one of the major <laughs> investors, and it started 18 months ago. So talk about uh, rapid change in technology as it relates to um, uh, transportation. I'm just curious who in the audience had heard of Uber before tonight? See? All right, man. Again, a company that started 18 months ago. <laughs> so 
That would take a question on the, on the right side. I, I think we're all here tonight because of our concern with congestion in Charleston, traffic and parking. And in your presentation, you showed charts of population growth or lack of growth, but you didn't present any charts that show the growth in tourism in Charleston. And I think that's where a lot of this comes from. Uh, but my issue is parking. I live on South Battery. If I leave my house mid-morning, the chances of me getting a parking spot on my block is near zero. And um, when I go to Costco on Saturday afternoon and I come home and I have to haul that stuff two blocks and I see a New Jersey plate in front of my house, I don't think that's right. My wife and I were in Boston last year. They have resident-only parking. If you're not a resident, you can't park. And I called the Boston Parking uh, Authority. They've had it for 25 years. They're very happy with it. They have no plans to change it. Then I went online. Dallas has it. Washington, D.C. has it. And other cities have it. So my question's for Tim. Uh, what reason would Charleston have for not providing resident-only parking? Hmm. <laughs> you kind well, of knew that was coming. Um, would you mind telling me what block of South Battery you live on? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want you to reveal. Which one? I could. Oh, right at East Battery. Okay. Well, that is a tough spot. <laughs> um, the um, I think you know anything as it relates to this, you know, we should study, no doubt about it, and 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 better ways to manage parking in the neighborhoods to address issues like you're raising are ones that we need to look at. Um, whether it's a neighborhood-wide, you know, kind of policy, or it has to do with you know, very specific block conditions within different neighborhoods where you have more impact from visitors and, and you know, blocks on South Battery are very dramatically, as you know. I mean, you're down by East Battery and <clears throat> you have your condition. If you're down by Council Street, it's a very different situation. Um, so I think we have to look very specifically at what the issues are within blocks of, of neighborhoods to, to, to maybe refine our, our parking regulations to address, you know, what are real issues uh, related to residents being able to park on the street. I mean, that's, that's very legitimate. I, I think the resistance has been towards blanket kinds of statements about, you know, uh, people shouldn't be allowed in this area because they're from New Jersey or anywhere else, or Mount Pleasant for that matter. <clears throat> um, you know, so I think it's the general idea that we, we need resident-only parking in this large area to keep these people out that, you know, ultimately city council votes on any change to a parking regulation. General ideas like that won't, I don't think have, my opinion, is a lot of chance, but very specific, more surgical changes to address, you know, real conditions like the one you're describing um, are should be completely part of this conversation and what we're discussing with any changes we make related to tourism management and addressing issues around parking as it relates to mobility. It's, it's, it's very legitimate. I have a question over here. Yes, um, I would think that from what I've heard tonight, we're not talking about a parking problem. Uh, we're talking about a mobility issue and the formula that I hear is a formula that uh, involves employer and employee, but I, I'm not speaking for seniors, but I'm concerned about those of us who uh, probably shouldn't even be driving, uh, but have as number one issue in most people who try to age in place is transportation. Um, I could be very optimistic about something that's happened in Portland for my reason to, to age in place, but that formula is driven by employer and employee. Is there a is there a uh, part of that formula that could take into consideration what seniors might spend and what they might add to the economy? 
Uh, let me, yeah, I'd like to address that too, and that to kind of emphasize when we talk about t certain technologies that these, uh, you know, these uh, uh, basically uh, pull technologies, uh, the Ubers and the ones that will follow, I mean, I think, I think the opportunity for cities, not just Charleston, but for cities, is to say, okay, here is a new and emerging technology that right now is basically, you know, software version 1.0, right? But, the, but this idea that you can, um, on, the, on the vehicle side of mobility, that this one person, one car, having to drive it and park, that there's going to be a, a number of different things that can crop up so that the, the young can have access to mobility in a car when they need it, so the old can, so anyone can. For people wanting to go out to a restaurant and not wanting to drive because they want to have that extra bottle of wine. There's all sorts of solutions there. There's solutions that can be worked into it for those that can pay for it, and they will pay for it, and then for those as part of the community that need to be assisted and they can be part of that formula. This is a new world that we're emerging here, but the great thing about it is, again, it's happening quickly. And there's a, it's at a point now where you can engage it and become a part of it. You don't have to sit here and plan and wait and build something for in 15 years, have to uh, see if it works or not. Let me take a stab at that, too. Um, one of the reasons oftentimes the focus is on employees is because they're the least efficient parker. And, and we also, they're a captive audience. So if we're working with their employers, we have control of that. And as we did in the Lloyd District, and I should note, we have three senior living centers in the Lloyd District. Um, it, it, by capturing those stalls and turning them over, we can then free them up for our residents off street, not on street. We can free those up for our residents and for our, our visitors. One employee stall denies us five visitor trips. And so for every stall that we can get an employee out of into a convenient mode, it's a parking stall not built. And then we do do parking triage. In the Lloyd District, for us, because of our partnership, the most valuable stall is a visitor stall. That's what everybody wants. Number two, residential. Number three, employees. And so again, by affecting that change with employees, we've taken 4,000 over 10 years on a typical day, there's 4,000 less cars parked for employees in our district than there were in 1997. That's 4,000 parking stalls for residents and visitors. The last thing I'll say is my mom is a senior citizen and we began to develop a thing called Lyft. It's different than the Lyft that you're aware of. My mom can call and she can get door-to-door -door service from her home to anywhere in the Portland region and she pays no more than the cost of a transit ticket, which is $2.50 a trip. So we need to begin to think, of, because I'm getting there too, of the aging population. First, there's the youth coming in, and then there's the aging population going out. And we need, and I, I, your point is very important, uh, because that's the next generation of, of solutions. But that's how we did it. It wasn't like, well, we're all focused on employees. No, it was we're focused on those stalls because those are the ones we can most effectively address through this partnership uh, because we can work with employers to, to make that change for us. Mm -hmm. And then other programs for seniors like Lyft, door-to-door -door transit. Which we have in Charlotte, too, by the way. Yeah. I'll ask lady on the far side. Tim. I'd like to ask you a question. I don't drive anymore. My daughter said, Mama, you sit and I'll drive. But for the bike lane, we don't have too many bike lanes in the city of Charleston. And I fear for the young people who are riding because sometimes I see them pull right in the front of cars. And I'm afraid they may hurt them. I don't know if the street is too small for the bike lane. And some of them are on skateboards also. And they just skate so fast on these skateboards. What can we do for them? Yeah, great point. And everybody, this is Reverend Alma Dungy, who is the president of the North Central Neighborhood Association um, with us tonight. Um, and and, and I, it's a really good point, and uh, <laughs> it, it's one I was making to some degree in, in my uh, slides in the sense that, uh, to me, that is the challenge, is, is to find ways to carve out more of the space on our narrow streets for bikes, for dedicated bike lanes, or extra space for sidewalks or, as I said, dedicated space for public transportation. Um, in some cases, it may be shared lanes with bicycles, but much safer conditions for bicycles. So, Reverend Dungey, you're right. I mean, that, that, that's very much a part of 
what this is about, is finding safer places for young people and everybody to be riding bicycles on our, our narrow streets. Thank you. We had a good discussion about that today, though, didn't we, Rick, about it? I think I'm a, I'm a cyclist in Charlotte, picked it back up at, uh, a few years ago when I needed to drop uh, 30 pounds and get a little more healthy here as I get into the 60s. And uh, one thing that, that I and other cyclists do in, uh, in Charlotte, and I know uh, it's a Portland model too in many cities, is that, that the reality is a lot of times the bike lanes, no matter how well-intentioned, that uh, they can be in, in traffic where speeds are, even in the 30, 35 range, a bit harrowing. I'd stay away from them. I, I, we used the term today, uh, a gorilla pass. We actually seek out, even though it might be longer, I do this when I ride mine, I, I seek out the neighborhood streets, streets where I know the traffic is low and the speeds by design of the, or as posted, are low, you know, that 25 mile per hour streets. And then, of course, you know, you find as a cyclist, I feel if the car is going the same speed I am, pretty much same direction, I've got a better shot than I do in a speeding situation. And I know some cities are starting to institutionalize that, right, Rick? Yeah. Um, it goes back to the lady who asked the question about the role the students can play. Um, we made a mistake going forward early on with our bike program because we let the city and no aspersions, mm -hmm. um, but just from what, their traffic, from their traffic models, uh, tell us where the bike lanes should be, mm -hmm. and so we striped some bike lanes, and we found out that no one was using them, because we were putting them on streets that were even the speeds were still fast. It was uh, the mindset was well, if a car wants to be on this street, well then a bike would want to be on that street as well, for all the reasons of getting through as fast as we can. Portland then stepped back, and it wasn't the Lloyd District, the, but Portland stepped back and said, why are people not using our bike lanes? And they started finally talking to the riders. And the riders said, here's how I get from Northeast Portland to downtown. Here's how I get from Southwest Portland to downtown. And we began through our uh, great statewide organization called the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, a beginning to design what I call guerrilla bikeways. Um, and now we have a project called the 40s because um, uh, bikes, bicyclists were telling us, we go this way, then we go this way, and then we go this way. And we didn't even have to put bike lanes on the streets, we put sharrows on the street. Remove no parking, uh, and a sharrow is a big giant decal. It looks like a bicyclist, and then it has an arrow that goes forward. And you put them about every 100 yards on a street in both directions. It notifies the drivers that there's bicycles in these lanes. And in some cases, we employed what are very mild speed bumps on those streets as well. And so the long story of it was we listened uh, to the user uh, and found out that um, they were the ones who were finding the safe routes. And then through our education program, through the uh, Go Lloyd now, we do trainings, we do guided bike rides, we do personalized trip planning, and we um, uh, use other bikers as mentors to people who want to bike. But so anyway, I think that's a great point, and the Reverend's right. But I think if we were to ask some experienced riders here, they might tell us what the best streets would be for, and we might not have to lose bike lane, um, parking or um, um, or actually put the lanes in. Just let them run with the cars. Right, thank you, Rick. Want to have a question over here? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think great discussion this evening. Uh, one of the things that occurs to me with all the various modes of transportation to satisfy the various uses that we have is I, while Tim, you talked briefly about the, the large targets relative to population growth on the peninsula, uh, it seems to me a land use plan is going to be a critical dependency here to try to build modals around what we think that growth is going to look like in terms of the mix between residential and business and various other uses. Uh, is that land use plan in place? Is that a part of this uh, process? Are they uh, intertwined? I'm just curious how those processes might work together. Tim. It's a really good point, and I, I think land use um, is essential to this, and it's the most boring uh, essential part of this, I guess. But, but the, the way in which the city's growing and that that pattern and intensity and density and types of uses are, are very much connected to how we'll build our transportation system. When it goes for those red areas I was showing on my map, the one area that, that, you know, that was a general plan for the peninsula, but the one area that needs a lot more detail is the upper peninsula along Morrison and Upper, upper Meeting Street. 
you know, the deep detailed plan for Horizon, the Union Pier area, Upper King and Meeting, Magnolia, of course. That's the one piece of that that's missing that we're actually, we went to the city's city councils, Council Member Gregory's committee, the Sustainability Advisory Committee today and presented to them, to them a plan that we're starting just now for that area called the Upper Peninsula Initiative to look specifically at this issue and others in that area. Thank you, Tim. We have time enough for two more questions. Ella? First of all, it's very encouraging. We've all been asked here tonight to discuss this because I think it gives those of us who are concerned about the issues, the mobility issues, a lot of optimism about it. Um, I live on the peninsula, uh, but I would like to point out that I don't think this is a problem for the residents of the peninsula only. It's a problem for the tourists whose quality of experience is impacted a lot uh, by the um, congestion or uh, their ability or inability to get around. And it certainly is a problem for people in the outlying areas of the city and the neighboring uh, cities as they come into town to for entertainment, uh, whatever. And as we think of the long range solutions or even the incremental ones over the years, I think it's important that people see some immediate effect. Uh, and one or two of these uh, have been mentioned tonight, but one thing that could be done without too much dramatic um, infrastructure change or really any infrastructure change at all is to get the mammoth tour buses off the downtown streets. Uh, and I want to know if there is any kind of immediate plan to do this. Well, the, 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 um, all of the buses are, are regulated the, the, and, and I, in the Tourism Advisory Committee, Kitty Robinson is the chair of it that, that's recently convened will be looking at that very issue. So that group, that advisory committee, and some focus groups that they establish will recommend changes to anything that we decide as a community need to be addressed, including the large tour buses um, in downtown. So that's definitely something to consider right now as that committee puts together its recommendations for city council. Any, as I said before, any of these changes that relate to regulations or management issues do go to city council and this advisory committee was created to make those recommendations so city council can get a comprehensive set of suggestions as to how we better manage tourism in Charleston. Hey, Kitty, when, when is the next public meeting of the Tourism Commission? It's June 12th. So a lot of issues uh, related to tourism, obviously that's an open forum I believe um, and, and the public is welcome to come and give their comments. It's at 6 o'clock at the Charleston Museum. Uh, last question with Robert. Thank you. I was really intrigued by what Mr. Williams was saying about his experience in Portland and how you kind of changed the thinking on, on parking. Here in Charleston we have, it's difficult to know how many variances were given for one parking place. Um, you really don't know exactly how many places are used for one business. They're parking variances, they're parking special exceptions. It's a very patched together system. Uh, and I know that you had an opportunity in, in your location to kind of begin anew. How do you unwind those agreements? How do you begin to understand the issues with existing businesses and existing leases to begin to unwind that so that you can have I think what seems certainly to be a more enlightened parking policy. Was that a problem? Was it difficult to do? And that, that was a question to me? That's a question to you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, well, one, it's education. Uh, it's, again, getting people in a room. I, I was, it took us two and a half years to put what was called the Lloyd District Partnership Plan together. We began in 1994 and we published the plan in 1997. So, uh, you know, I can talk about how easy it seems now, but it was two and a half years of negotiations between lots of parties. Unwinding those agreements and unwinding um, the code um, takes time. Um, 
for instance, we had to get, again, like Premier Partners, when we just got a, um, agreements from building owners to unbundle their parking, they did that over time because they had a five-year lease and I get five stalls. So they agreed that they were going to unwind that over time. In the beginning, not everybody joined on. The same thing when we had uh, Premier Partners step up and say, I'll buy transit passes for my employees. Um, we had five that did it out of the gate. Today we have 85 businesses that do it. Um, so it was a matter of just making the commitment, then having the organization monitor and report objectively how we were doing. But then there was a lot of public outreach, meetings just like this, where we report back, we do an annual report, where we report back what's going on. And then finally, data. Um, we were showing that um, parking was more efficient when we began to charge for it. Um, our lease rates went down in the early years, and we became more competitive because the parking wasn't in there. It was your choice. And then it was your choice as a business to buy it or pass that cost on to your employee. So the long answer to your question, I think you hit it on the, the head. This takes time. But that unwinding really is getting some partners who are willing to do it, getting an organization of partners willing to report it and be objective, and then lots of education behind it. So today, we don't have any buildings in our district that do not unbundle their parking. But it probably took us five to seven years to unwind all of those agreements. But it became more efficient for some of our building owners because if we were getting a new property to come in, a new tenant to come into our district, because the parking was unbundled and the system became more efficient, we could bring an inefficient business into the Lloyd District and give them all the parking they wanted, as long as they were willing to pay for it. Within two years, they were given the parking back. So by unbundling it, everybody was going in with the same thing. You get three per thousand. But if you unbundled the rate, some people were coming in and say, I don't want any parking because I'll take that really cool transit program. Other businesses were say, I'm just going to pass that cost on to my employees. Other businesses said, I need a lot and I'm willing to pay for it. So um, it's time, time and perseverance. Well, one, one last question. I'll keep my remarks at the end brief. Great, thank you. Um, oh, wait, uh, my question has more to do with the short term and in terms of public transportation. And I feel like something that's much more important than my ability to get an Uber on this phone is the fact that Carta's entire schedule is embedded into my Google Maps, and I can click a button that shows me how I can get a Carta bus wherever I want, and I don't even need the Carta app. And I'm wondering if there are any initiatives underway to make the system more robust in terms of, I'd be more than willing to take public transportation to, say, the Terrace Theater or to the airport, but the gaps are so wide that it makes it really difficult for me to do that. So it's a bit of a general question, but um, I guess, Mr. Keene, I'm interested to know if there are any initiatives, and the other gentleman, um, if you could recommend anything. Are you speaking specifically of CARTA-related? Well, just the public transportation system in general, in terms of buses, um, that kind you of thing. Come on. Christine Wilkerson is here from CARTA, and, and on the front row, so it'll just take her a second to get up here. So. <laughs> Maybe Christine could speak to this, because there's many things they're doing to try to improve service and, and implement new technologies that make it easier to ride the bus. Thank you, Tim. Um, first, I'm going to say I'm, it's going to be very hard not to talk for like an hour. Um, but in answer to your question, first of all, um, we really appreciate that you are using Google Transit and it's working really well for you. That was a, an effort that we undertook with the um, Regional Planning Agency, the Council of Governments, to get all of those data points into the system. And one of the things it's also allowed us to do is to put real-time bus information available through our website. So if you are standing at a bus stop location, you can pick your stop location and check the real-time. By real-time, I mean where exactly is the bus and how many more minutes before it gets here. So having that foundation allowed us to take that technology step further. Um, in general, my quick answer as it relates to a more robust public transportation system is that um, basically it's going to take a new source of funding and a new level of commitment from the community. Um, we're doing everything we can at this point to deploy as much service as possible. 95% you know, uh, of our budget is spent on operations. What that's done is that less, has left um, us in a 
not a really great position from a capital standpoint. We have a lot of buses that are getting old and we're going to need to replace them. But we also recognize that we have to be significant to the region and we're going to need other regional partners in order to expand our service area and also to expand the funding base for the system that will eventually be in place. And that could really be anything from bus rapid transit or light rail, conventional rail. Um, really the region's going to have to come together to think about and look at what kind of system do we really want to have? What kind of system do we need to compete with cars? We have a unique situation on the peninsula um, in that it, it's very much like a large city, but it's not of the scale of larger cities that allow for the level of funding that you need for things like historic streetcars or uh, five minute frequency of service or instead of large buses, a, a lot of smaller buses or electric buses or all the different kinds of things that we could deploy. So um, our plan is uh, to pursue a regionalist approach uh, to expand our partnerships with other stakeholders, if you will, employers, government agencies, et cetera, and, and really take a very hard look very soon as to what the region needs. And that's the plan that Tim alluded to earlier. Uh, we need a regional plan. We need to hear from our community and what they want and what they need and also what they're willing to support. Currently, um, per capita in Charleston, the amount of funding um, for transit specifically is around about $10 per person per year. And if you think about what you are able to do with a system that is supported at that level, the system's really pretty good. But in larger cities like Portland, I'm sure that funding per capita is more in the order of $150 annually per person. And so we have to think about what kind of funding we need in order to have the system that we ultimately want. And with that, I'm going to stop. But thank That's you correct. for the opportunity thank to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, did you want to say something and wrap up? Are you good? Okay. <laughs> well, I want to thank the speakers um, uh, for, for their uh, presentations here tonight. I think it's been very informative. I also want to thank our sponsors for putting this together, uh, as well as, of course, all of you who came out tonight to share your thoughts and concerns. And as I stated before the presentations began, I think it's important that everyone here tonight uh, understand and remember that this forum, as we see it, uh, is just the beginning of a major dialogue and effort to address uh, the future transportation issues and mobility issues that face the peninsula and perhaps the region as a whole. We ultimately foresee uh, a nonprofit slash public and perhaps private sector collaboration to invite additional experts uh, to the downtown, uh, to help the downtown community formulate a shared vision for the complex and interconnected aspects of transportation. I mean, if you consider the major, any major livability issue uh, that has been presented for, by downtown residents in Charleston today, transportation really, in my mind, is at the heart of it all. Charleston, we all know, is on fire. And the city, as we heard tonight and, and read in the paper, has uh, a fairly aggressive but probably very realistic goal for promoting the economic development and population growth on the peninsula. Um, I mean, this is the 25,000 residents, basically almost doubling the city's population potentially within 15 years. It's happening, and we as a city need to honor our traditions of staying in front of these complex issues. Because the status quo, as we all know, won't work. As a community, we need to be more proactive in shape shaping the growth on the peninsula and how we move around it. This will require confronting head-on thorny and complex issues, but it must be done. And we have to understand and appreciate that there's no silver bullet. This is not going to be an easy process. There are going to be a lot of trial and error, but the important part, the important component of this is to try something. Um, there are examples out there, technologies there, as we've heard tonight. What we need as a community is to gather behind a vision and put the will in place to get it done. Thank you all coming out. I uh, appreciate it and have a good evening.